The Iran-backed military group Houthi has pledged to continue its attacks on ships in the Red Sea and its support for Hamas in Gaza. So, with tensions escalating, what happens if they retaliate to the overnight airstrikes by the West? Could this mean that we are heading for an all-out war? Joining me now to discuss this, Edmund Fitton Brown, the former UK ambassador to Yemen. Thank you so much for joining us again, sir. Good to have you back on the programme. And Arash Azizi, a lecturer in history and political Thank science. You. Good to have you both on the programme. Let's uh, start um, with Edmund, please. Um, can you explain who these Houthis are. They're known as rebels, but actually they're governing vast swathes of Yemen. Yeah, uh, the, the Houthi movement uh, comes originally from the uh, far north, the landlocked far north of Yemen. And it was a, 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 a movement with a very strong uh, religious character. They're from the uh, Yemeni minority, Zaidi Shia population. And they uh, arose in opposition to the previous president, Ali Abdullah Saleh. Um, and fought a number of wars against him while he was still president. Um, and the Saleh government could never put them down successfully. Yemen went into a political change after the Arab Spring, and um, Saleh was replaced by uh, his previous deputy, uh, former president, Hadi. And the Houthis took that opportunity to, uh, to be more aggressive and to push across Yemen, and they were remarkably successful. They were very strong um, fighters, uh, and they took Sana'a in 2014, and then spread further in 2015. And then um, when Saudi Arabia became involved on the side of the Hadi government, uh, the conflict stabilized and the Houthis were pushed back from the south. Um, but the sort of the line of engagement between the Houthis and the uh, and the internationally recognised government of Yemen has become has been more stable over recent years. I mean, they're, they're, they're described variously as a kind of military outfit, a, a kind of po political and philosophical kind of ruling governmental outfit, and a religious movement. It's quite hard if you're not, as you are, you know, steeped in the area, the customs and the culture, to really understand quite who they are and quite how deeply they hold sway. So religiously, for example, can you explain their religious affiliation, which obviously is a great passion, isn't it, of their existence? Yes, the, the majority population of Yemen is Sunni Muslim. But there is a large minority, which is the Zaidi branch of Shia Islam. This helps to explain why the Houthis are close to Iran and sometimes compared with Lebanese Hezbollah, because uh, they're sometimes described as Shia. And uh, they are fanatically religious. Um, and they're also a militia. So they are all the things that you've mentioned. They are religious extremists. They are uh, fighters. And they are now occupying uh, a large chunk of Yemen, not actually the majority of Yemen in terms of geographical extent, but the majority in terms of the population. Let me bring in Arash Azizi. Thank you for joining us. Now, can you, can you explain to us why it is that the Houthis decided that the right thing to do would be to get involved in uh, naval traffic in the Red Sea? And when I say get involved, I mean to do its best to destroy and impede progress of shipping throughout the world in this way. Why was this something that they thought was, was important to do and to pursue? Uh, well, it's what they can do uh, because of the geographical location that they had. They realized very soon that they're able to have this big effect on, on global shipping. This way they would galvanize themselves uh, domestically, uh, try to build the legitimacy to themselves as, as, a, uh, as a group fighting Israel uh, and get some domestic legitimacy, some international fame. And frankly, they did. I mean, there are uh you know they they gain some degree of support in the arab world and and even beyond um because of uh, the kind of disruptive actions that they were able to have and a sort of an indirect um a contribution uh to the war uh, against israel it's also noteworthy that uh, when it comes to this axis of resistance this uh, sort of an umbrella of groups operated uh by, by tehran by the islamic republic of iran um the the houthis uh, played an important role here because the 
uh, groups like Hezbollah in Lebanon were worried about getting more directly involved with Israel because that could have uh, spread the war and it could have been sort of suicidal for Hezbollah. Whereas for the Houthis, um, they could shoot a couple of missiles uh, at Israel as they try to do, which you know, it's far away, so it wouldn't get anywhere, um, but also uh, attack uh, everybody else. Uh, all these ships is a bit farcical, have like nothing to do with Israel, of course. Uh, most of the ships that they attacked, even though they sort of lie and deny that. Um, and in this way, they could show some symbolic uh, resistance to Israel, whereas uh, without getting into a direct uh, confrontation. But of course, they uh, might have played their hands too strongly, as we see by the uh, attacks by uh, US and UK, following weeks of warning and a Security Council resolution that, of course, uh, was passed and not vetoed by uh, Russia or China either. I mean, you say that they may have played their hand too successfully. On the other hand, their robust response to the military attacks last night is, we care little for this, we are going to retaliate, we are going to continue doing exactly what we did before and you won't have deterred us in any particular whatsoever. But is that simply bravado and is that effectively what they would be expected to say or is it true? Well, they have a lot of room to go still. You see, it becomes some sort of a test of the wheels. Uh, the fact of the matter is U.S. And, and the other Western countries for a very long time have wanted to get out of the Middle East. Um, president Biden, the third president in a row, who wants to decrease U.S. presence in the Middle East and yet finds himself involved in military action there, which has little support or even little understanding for it. Uh, frankly, when I look at the discourse in the U.S., I think um, a lot of people who are talking about this don't really even understand what the Houthis are, you know, where is Yemen? Um, and so there's there's sort of a really shrinking support uh, for these actions, although we'll see in the long term. So the Houthis uh, will do what uh, forces of this axis of resistance and Iran have, have done for a very long time. They, uh, they bet that they can wait them out. And the, the reality is, uh, we should remember a very long civil war um, with extensive interventions by Saudi Arabia um, and other Arab countries failed to dislodge the Houthis. They hold the power in Sana'a. And even before the current conflict, Saudis are effectively negotiating with them. Um, the rival governments, there are two more rival governments in Yemen. The main one that is internationally recognized controls very little, has, has little sway. Um, there is some hope for some sort of a UN-mediated um, a process that can finally bring about sort of a united Yemen in, in some sorts. I mean, previous uh, to these events, uh, you know, there was that hope, but Houthis effectively control much of the, um, you know, much of the territory yeah. and majority of the population. And we, and, we know um, that, and we know that in that civil war, in that conflict, something like 377,000 people have lost their lives. I mean, it's a huge, a huge... Um, death toll notched up in, in, in Yemen that, as you say, lots of people all over the world don't know about and don't even really know where Yemen is. You're quite right to say that. So that's why it's important that we try to explain, isn't it, on the programme, where this is, why it's happening, what's going on, for goodness sake. Let me bring Edmund Fitton Brown back into this conversation. You were ambassador to Yemen, so obviously have great insight into what could potentially go on in that country. So if this let, let's say this remains at the level that it's at at the moment. So therefore, let's imagine that tonight, possibly um, British forces, American forces, and those supporting them in this, in this action do what they did again. And there are more very carefully targeted uh, missiles dropped on Houthi targets that are you know, chosen with care and that everybody can say in their a description are proportionate, et cetera. So let's imagine there's just a repeat of last night. What do you think will happen next? And then, of course, I'm going to ask you whether you think this will escalate. Yeah, I think so. One of the big debates around this has been the likelihood of escalation. And um, part of that picture is whether or not the Iranian Houthi uh, coordination is so strong that the Iranians are all in with the Houthis because the Houthis have been effectively the most reckless and the most aggressive of all of the uh, axis of resistance militias that are aligned with Iran. And um, I heard the comment earlier about the fact that Lebanese Hezbollah had been less aggressive. And it's true that they're also more under the control of the Iranians. Um, and so I think you can read in the sort of the more cautious approach of Lebanese Hezbollah, the fact that Iran is not wanting a, an escalation in, these, in this scenario. And so the question is, have the Houthis gone beyond what the Iranians would have really wanted? 
And with action taken against the Houthis by the US and the UK and others, um, does Iran feel that its own interests have been attacked or does Iran want to sort of back elegantly out of it? And I think it's probably the latter. Uh, I think that in a sense, the Houthis are the vanguard and they are to some degree on their own here. And uh, in a sense, the strength of the response by the uh, US-led um, coalition here is that it's, 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 it's gradated, uh, calibrated response, and it's specifically targeting the Houthis' capability to continue to wreak havoc in the Red Sea. And this is really important, because when people talk about engagement in the Middle East region, this is not that. This is keeping international shipping lanes open. Mm. It's effectively counter-piracy on a certain level. Yes. And it's absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. And uh, the US and the UK must continue this policy, and they must step it up to establish deterrence. It's not a matter of invading Yemen. There never will be an invasion of Yemen. Mm. And indeed, the Houthis don't represent Yemen. They're not the government of Yemen. There is a government of Yemen. The Houthis are a, a militia that illegally controls a significant part of Yemen. It doesn't control all of the Red Sea coast and their capability in the Red Sea is limited. And therefore, countering that capability is a more straightforward proposition, not an easy one, mm -hmm. but still not as difficult a proposition as uh, some kind of boots on the ground scenario that you referred to. And just to say, there have been scenes of the most vehement protest going on in Yemen today, and I think we can show footage of that. There's absolute uh, tremendous eruptions of outrage and fury and, and all of that kind of thing. Uh, here we see it now, look at that. I mean, absolute masses of, 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 um, of protest there. And, and Edmund, you, you might explain who these people are that are protesting and why they're taking to the streets of Yemen with such... Uh, alacrity and force. Gosh, look at that. Well, wow. again, let's be careful when we say the streets of Yemen. I mean, this is likely to be uh, Sana'a uh, and, and Houthi-controlled Yemen. And the Houthi renter mob capability is very extensive. They can always bring outraged people out onto the streets whenever they want to. I'd take it a bit more seriously if I saw outrage being expressed on the streets of Aden, which is controlled by the uh, legitimate government of Yemen. And one thing I do want to, a point I want to make that has not really been made, at least I haven't heard it made recently, um, is that the Houthis say that they've been targeting Israeli interests, that this is all solidarity with the Palestinians. But very little Israeli or Israeli-associated shipping actually uses the Red Sea. And the people that the Houthis have been injuring are the people of Egypt, ordinary, poor Arabs. The economy of a country that should not have any particular fight with the Yemenis, with which they have very close historic um, relations. And the Egyptian economy is heavily dependent on the Suez Canal. And the Houthis have been recklessly sabotaging the economy of Egypt and doing almost no harm to Israel. Thank you both very much indeed for making a, a I mean, a perplexing and, and in, in many cases, fairly kind of obscure situation, much more vivid and much easier to understand. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate your expertise. Come